at your country. It sparkles. Canada, I tote your sparkles. Canada sparkles. McBride TV in stereo has something extra for you. The Hitachi Luminar 20 television gives you proven reliability and 105 channel capacity. Plus, you have the Hitachi Touch. The Hitachi Touch. Some people have it, some people don't. McBride TV in stereo has it. McBride TV in stereo at the corner of 6th and Columbia in the heart of downtown U.S. Minster. Announcing the March Madness Sale at Saks 4th Avenue. This week only, prices are slashed 50%. That's right, 50% off beautiful oil paintings and 18, 14, and 10 karat gold. Choose from hundreds of gallery art selections and frames. And quality, Italian crafted gold chains and bracelets at their best prices ever. 50% off during March Madness, this week only at Saks 4th Avenue. Save now, a block and a half west of Burrard at 1943 West 4th. Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. British Columbia is poised for its massive coal deal selling metallurgical materials to the Japanese steel industry. And British Columbia, in the form of the Social Credit Government, is gloating with delight at the prospect of this fantastic bonanza, they say. On the other hand, how are the Canadians doing in getting the Japanese to give us some preference the other way around in trade? Not so good. But yesterday, by happenstance, uh, old Leatherlungs Phillips and Ron Basford were up at the site at Tum Tumbler Ridge, uh, setting off a ceremonial blast. A pathetic little peep. Phillips could have blown it further with his famous leather lungs. And that is the first blast of the 15 million tons oh, well. TONNES, which are going to go to Japan. A little bit about that, and then we're going to cross-question Ed Lumley, a liberal cabinet minister from on Ottawa, his writing is in Ontario, about how poorly he got on in trade docks with the Japanese from which he has just returned. Um, another liberal MP this morning, I do apologize, but I needed the content, is Warren Ullman, who was a very controversial cabinet minister when he was a cabinet minister in the pre-Clark liberal government. But he's the man who's concerned with El Salvador, as you should be and I should be. Which side we should be on, he'll tell us. Now, for a local story this morning, I promised that Steve would be out and about. And so he's going to look at uh, one of the oldest buildings in downtown Vancouver, the corner of Stanley Park. Wonderful old place with a cupola, cupola, cupola. And they're going to tear it down on April Fool's Day and put up another apartment. First, though, for the Japanese trade and for Tumblr Ridge and Ed Lumley after the break. The press were taken up to the town site at Tumblr Ridge to watch the first big blast signifying the ceremonial takeoff of the 7.7 million tons of coal to Japan. And we were there, all set for a massive explosion. We're now looking over 
the general area of the mine sites. I think that's Bull Moose, I'm not quite sure. And we'll come down across. They don't have to buy it from British Columbia, Columbia, but they have chosen to buy it from British Columbia, and that will provide jobs and will help our balance of payments. But don't forget one thing. We have a good steel industry in Canada, but that steel industry in Canada buys its coking coal, not in Canada, but in the United States of America. So what really is the difference? All we're doing is offsetting what the Eastern steel firms are sending out dollars to buy coking coal in the United States. So the Japanese are bringing it back, buying coking coal from British Columbia. Why don't they buy it from us? Why don't the Eastern companies buy it from BC? Well, that's a good question. And uh, they traditionally bought it in the United States. I don't think anybody's ever put it in a computer, they say now, because of the cost of transportation that uh, they can't afford to buy it here. But I think if the Japanese can transport it all the way from British Columbia to Japan, then maybe we better take a second look at it. It. But uh, the, the Eastern Steel companies in Ontario have never bought their coking coal in British Columbia. Ontario Hydro, indeed, are buying some steam coal, but the Eastern Steel companies haven't been buying any coking coal. We're uh, exporting, actually, some of the world's finest metallurgical coal at very high prices. And the uh, mining industry and the f forest industry and forest products industry are an important part of the Canadian economy. The uh, last federal budget in their um, development policies spoke specifically about the resource sector of the country and the need for the federal government in ways that it had not done before to stimulate activity in the resource sector. Um, Canada has grown wealthy out of the resource sector and will continue to, to be wealthy, I think, out of the resource sector. And here comes the ceremonial blast again. One stick of dynamite. Restraint is in in British Columbia these days. But, that was a funny rumble at the back there. Anyway, all of which brings us to the point that uh, British Columbia and the Northeast Coal Development Agency have made this deal, and we had Phillips on the other day about it, 7.7 .7 million tons with federal cooperation building the Ridley Coal Port, and the first shipments in foreign bottoms, of course, will sail from the Ridley Island Coal Port to Japan, hopefully on the 1st of January or thereabouts, 1984. Now, by happenstance and coincidence this morning, Ed Lumley, Canada's Minister of Trade, is in Vancouver, having returned from Japan. Now, sir, is this a good coal deal for Canada? Yes, it is. I understand you're meeting with Bennett and Phillips today. Yes, I'm going to bring them up to date, uh, Jack, uh, with respect to the meetings I had uh, in Japan last week. I take it from the press reports that you were somewhat snubbed in your efforts to get Japan to look more kindly at lumber exports from British Columbia. Well, we talked about a uh, broad range of, uh, of issues with Japan. Uh, what we talked about is we agree, obviously, with free trade. We want some fair trade, and we want uh, the Japanese to give uh, equal access uh, to products from Canada in the same way we give access to Japanese products. And we specifically talked about the forest products industry and the automobile industry. And in both cases, the representations I made were rejected uh, by the Japanese authorities. Let's take them one at a time. In what way did they reject you on the forest industry? And our forest industry, as you know, is in a pretty bad way right now. We need all the help we can get well, from the, anybody. The two major issues, uh, which we think will increase the uh, sales from Japanese, uh, two Japanese markets from British Columbia, are A, uh, changes in the uh, softwood plywood standards, uh, which uh, they have agreed to, and hopefully by the midsummer. These standards will change and therefore softwood plywood from British Columbia will now be able to be used in, in construction for housing in Japan. At the present moment, our softwood plywood standards don't suit the Japanese? No, not at all. And are we changing or are they accepting our standards? They're going to change their standards and hopefully they, those, their standards uh, will be equal to our standards. The U.S. has a different set of standards and there's a chance they may use the U.S. standards which may not be advantageous to us. So that's a little bit of good news. Yes. All being well, we might be able to export some plywood for construction to Japan. But the big issue is the 10% tariff on spruce, pine, and fir, uh, which representation is made by the Premier of this province, by our Prime Minister, by ministers of several governments, by uh, COFI, uh, Council of uh, Foreign in uh, uh, Forest Industries, uh, over the last eight years. And I was uh, most disturbed to find out that the Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Forestry from Japan 
who's responsible for that aspect, uh, wasn't even aware of, of our complaints in that regard. Didn't even know about the complaints. Didn't even know about it when I raised it with So him. the high-level negotiations between Trudeau and Bennett and whoever in Japan didn't filter down to the people who matter. Well, there's a new minister, obviously. He's been just appointed the last couple of months, but uh, the fact I was trying to impress upon the Japanese is that they've got to be sensitive uh, to the major issues here in Canada with respect to market penetration. Here is probably the largest single uh, sensitive issue as far as uh, British Columbia is concerned and uh, it doesn't cost them much. It's not something that really impacts on their market. It's, an, it's uh, more for ourselves to make sure the inland suppliers are, have an equitable Did you ask them coastal. straight out to lift this 10% tariff on uh, Canadian spruce? Pine and fir. Pine and fir. You asked them? Yes. What did they say? No. Just no? Well, they said they'd study it, but that means no. That means no. It's pretty arrogant of the Japanese, is it not? Well, uh, we're, we're kind of disturbed that we don't have equal access. Uh, the Council of Forest Industries and uh, British Columbia businessmen have made substantial representation to me saying, look, we've got to have easier access to the Japanese market in the same way they have access to our market. And that's why we made the representation we did. Now, will you now go back and tell Trudeau that the Japanese hadn't even listened to him and that you want him to try again to try and hit somebody over the head diplomatically and say, what about this? Well, this you know, this sort of ties in with the whole meeting we had at Key game between the Americans, the Europeans, uh, and the Japanese, and the fact that uh, if we're going to preserve the liberalized international trading system, which we've all benefited from, particularly Canada and Japan, uh, it's important uh, during the next six to 18 months when all the industrialized nations are experiencing difficult economic times, that the nations are sensitive to particular issues in, in each other's uh, country. This, is it much of a market for fir, spruce, and pine in Japan yes. from here? Yes, oh, sure is. It's a big market. Big market. With the 10% off, if they ever wake it up and take it off, would that make us more competitive? It would make us more competitive, but it would also ensure that the inland uh, producers have equal access as the coastal producers, as far as British Columbia is concerned, uh, which obviously that there's more of a problem inland than there is in the coast. Now, as far as the uh, Toyotas and Datsuns and whatnot are concerned, the Americans have restrictions, voluntary restrictions by the Japanese in shipping them to their market. Do so they? do we. We do. So do we as up until uh, March 31st. After that, what happens? Uh, well, there's no agreement right now. The Americans have uh, another two years on their agreement. We don't have an agreement. That's one of the reasons I went last what week. What does that mean? Th what does that mean in, in a bad way for us? If after March the 31st, there are no voluntary restrictions for Japanese imports to Canada of cars. Well, if we don't come to some kind of uh, mutual understanding, uh, not necessarily by the magic day of April 1st, but uh, sometime in the first couple of months, uh, obviously with uh, the downtrend in our market and the increase in Japanese exports, uh, their market penetration will be the highest in history. What are you going to do about it? Well, we've asked them to consider a voluntary reduction in automobiles, a ceiling on commercial vehicles, and uh, if uh, the Japanese uh, aren't sensitive to our issues, then there's a, a variety of uh, steps that, that Canada can take. By, by voluntary reduction, do you mean by something dramatic like 50%? Because no. your automobile industry in Ontario is dying. Yes, it's not exactly in the best of straits right now. How much of a reduction do you want? Well, we have asked them to give us nothing less than what they'll give the United States. Uh, one of our problems we feel with, uh, with Japan is that they treat us like the 51st state and uh, they look at North America as one big market and we've tried to impress upon them that they were, we're different. Uh, to give you an example, when they look at Europe, they don't look at Europe as a, as a community, they look at Europe by individual country and they can't penetrate the French market for more than 3% of automobiles, they can't penetrate the British market for more than 10%, uh, they can't penetrate uh, the Belgian market and German market. But when it comes to North America, they look at us uh, as uh, all one big happy family and I've tried to indicate to them that uh, that uh, we're, we're different and uh, they've got to start treating Canada and not just add to the negotiations with the United States. In other words, they'll say, the hell with you, we're sending as many cars as we can sell to Canada and God bless you. Well, they've increased their market in automobiles from 12% uh, in 1979 to 23% in 1981. They've increased their, their penetration uh, from 6% in commercial vehicles to 16% in 1981. And if you uh, assume that they'll ship the same amount as last year, which they'd like to do, and that we have a declining market, uh, that penetration could easily go over the 30% mark. And that's just not acceptable to us. No, but you must move as a government and stop it. Yes. When? Well, we'll wait and see uh, the final response to our proposals. Uh, they're negotiating with the Americans right now. Uh, they won't finish those negotiations probably until the end of April. 
and it's highly unlikely they'll make a final decision on our proposal until such time as they finish the And what you want minimally is the same restriction as they accept for the American market yes. percentage-wise. Well, for 1980, for example, they had uh, a seven. They accepted 1980 figures uh, calendar year minus 7.7%. Uh, with ourselves, they accepted uh, fiscal year uh, minus six percent, and uh, that would mean a reduction of about uh, thirty thousand vehicles if we had uh, parity with the United States in That'd automobiles big alone. Big help for our car industry. Sure, and, 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 and that's not the panacea to the whole problem. Obviously, we've got some structural problems within our own industry. I have said to the Canadian manufacturers, you uh, you want us to be sensitive to your needs in the industry. You want Japan to be sensitive to Canada's economic needs. Well, we want the automobile manufacturers to be sensitive to our needs as well. You mean build a better car? Well, not only build a better car, but source more parts in Canada. They're sourcing more parts in Japan, Mexico, uh, Brazil, other countries. We want them to source more parts in Canada. More with Ed Lumley, Federal Minister of Trade, after the break. Ed Lumley is Trade Minister for Canada. You really laid it on the line there. You want the Japanese to behave more reasonably. Uh, your government, you recommend to the government that we take some fairly tough action against them. Well, we just want to be treated fairly, that's all. As fairly as the Americans as are As fairly treated. as the Americans. And as fairly as, as we treat the Japanese. I think the proposals we put towards them, I spend a great deal of time putting myself in their shoes. I mean, they have political problems too. Uh, they have pressures too from their industry. And we tried to put a proposal forward we thought would have the least amount of impact in their market and yet to relieve a bit of the pressure in our domestic situation. I never understand this, but where does the trade, the favorable trade balance lie between Japan and Canada? Well, 1981 figures will have a surplus of estimated about 400 million, but uh, that's a substantial drop from the 2.1 billion which we had in 1979. On the face of it, therefore, we're doing well, but the trouble is we're selling them raw materials and taking their manufactured goods. Only 3% of the goods that we sell the Japanese are what we call end products, so in the, in the labor intensive side. 97% of the goods they sell us are in the labor intensive they side. They use us, if you'll forgive the expression, as hewers of wood and drawers of water. Well, we're good hewers of wood and drawers of water, but uh, the last couple of years we've been able to penetrate other sophisticated markets around the world, such as the United States, uh, Germany, the United Kingdom, with manufactured goods, but we haven't been able to penetrate the Japanese market. So uh, we obviously, uh, if we weren't penetrating other markets, then, then maybe uh, the blame all the rest with Canadian businessmen. But Let's look the at the Northeast Coal deal, which really started this morning with that one dynamite stick blast. And we're going to sell them. It's a $2 billion deal billion five from the Japanese and a billion infrastructure from us. We're going to hope that we're going to get our expenditures back in taxation eventually. Is that a good deal for us or have you looked at it and do you think that we're subsidizing the coal for Japanese steel mills? Well, I only speak for, for the federal government. I was involved back in 1977 when I was the parliamentary secretary to the minister for DRE when Mr. Phillips first made his presentation to Ottawa with respect uh, to Northeast Coal. And uh, we as a federal government will not be subsidizing uh, a non-renewable resource. Uh, we will uh, recoup our, our costs over, over the uh, period of the contract. Uh, it's estimated by the middle 80s that we'll be supplying about 25% of the coal needs for Japan. So we'll be a very substantial supplier. But I think it's, been a, it's a good deal for Canada. So therefore we have a fair amount of clout in Japan because they can't do without our coal. Is that right? Well, I, don't wanna, uh, we, I didn't get into that, uh, Jack. I, we don't believe in linkages. We don't believe in trading off one versus the other. Why uh, not? Well, I, it's not uh, it's not good policy, and it's very short-sighted. In, in you take in my time. washing, I'll take in your washing. Well, I don't I don't think official linkages in the long run prove to be a benefit uh, for a country, particularly a country like Canada, which depends for almost one third of its GNP in, in export markets. Uh, it could get you into some trouble down the road. Okay, but don't we have a haven't the Japanese parties to GATT and all these other tariff arrangements? Yes. Well, how did they get away with this 10 percent tariff on our spruce? Pe uh, Fine and <laughs> spruce pine and fir. <laughs> yeah, spruce pine and fir. Spruce fine and fir. Yeah. Well, that was that was for negotiation during the Tokyo round of the GATT, and uh, it was one of the issues which we raised with them that they refused to, to reduce. But oh. it was something during negotiation. Okay, t cars are a big thing, and you're going to be hard nosed on cars. They've got to come down at least to American standards, or you'll take unilateral action. Well, we'll there's some various alternatives we can take. Okay, cars, fir, spruce and pine. What else did you nag them about, about which they were not aware of our problems? Well, for example, uh, the NTT, Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, which is like the Bell Canada of, of, of Canada, uh, they procure about $3 billion worth of telecommunications equipment a year. 
And uh, the U.S., uh, under the GATT, negotiated procure open procurement um, uh, during the past uh, round in the GATT. And they're bringing a mission here to Canada. We'd like to be able to tap into to some of that market. Uh, we've also talked to the Japanese about bringing an investment mission. They're going to bring, I think, sometime in April, an investment mission to Canada. You mean to buy the whole place? No, no. I mean, they want a big chunk of it now. Well, you know, they'd be pretty good partners. Uh, the Japanese have substantial interests uh, in the energy field, for example. Uh, now, with the implementation of the GATT, you can get access to the U.S. market uh, for about 85 percent of the goods duty-free by the end of the 1980s. You can get a secure supply of energy uh, here in Canada, as yeah. well as relatively cheap prices and compared to the Americans, so there's no reason why they can't locate manufacturing plants uh, here in Canada. Okay, one last question. What about our lumber trade with the United States? It's disastrous at the moment. Do you want to see the Canadian dollar to go down to 75 cents? And would that help us to recover our vast lost, temporarily lost markets? Well, as a matter of fact, with respect to the United States, our share of market, Canadian share of market, lumber market in the U.S. has increased substantially. And we have actually reduced our, our marketing programs at the, at the present time because uh, our penetration is high enough and we don't want to push the U.S. government into taking unilateral action. There ain't no market at the moment. I mean, it's not there. We can't sell lumber to them at the moment. Well, that's short term. I mean, the fact that we've increased our share of market, I think, is important. So when the market does upsurge, then there'll be substantial job increases uh, here in British Columbia. Well, you're obviously very concerned as an Eastern Cabinet Minister about the auto industry in, in Ontario. Are you worried at all about the lumber of the forest products industry in BC, and have you done anything with Washington? about trying to get him to start his housing. Not only did I make representation to Washington, but I came out here to the West Coast uh, in the United States, uh, in Washington and California, uh, during the month of November uh, with respect to trying to assist uh, the Council of Forest Industries in increasing its, its sale uh, to the United States. No luck, though. Well, I think we had some luck. Uh, the representation, as you know, we made at, at Portland, Oregon, in Washington with respect to the International Trade Commission. You know, the U.S. has asked for sanctions and tariffs against uh, Canadian lumber, and uh, we've made representation to resist that because it's a North American problem, not just a U.S. problem. How long do you think this court recession is going to last? Another six months. Six months only? So you're, I think. you're an optimist. I'm an optimist. I'm always an optimist. Trade I'm ministers are always an optimist. Yeah, I suppose so. I don't know if we can raise any calls to you this morning, but we'll try it. People are probably annoyed about the Japanese car industry, probably a little bit skeptical about the Northeast coal industry, and certainly should be upset about this Japanese cabinet minister who didn't even know about the 10% tariff on our lumber. Say what you want to Ed Lumley. Quite a nice guy, even if he is from Cornwall, Ontario. <laughs> After the break. Ed Lumley, Federal Minister of Trade. You're annoyed at the Japanese at the moment, aren't you? Be undiplomatic. I'm not exactly happy with their sensitivity to our situation. Lack of sensitivity. And they're the people who are supposed to show all the nuances of diplomatic sensitivity, right? Well, we were very diplomatic in our representation uh, last week, but I want them to know that uh, we expect a little fair treatment. Yeah, we're not getting fair treatment. Go ahead to the Trade Minister. Yes, Mr. Lumley. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering, uh, it seems to me that perhaps the Japanese just don't take us very seriously. Uh, I was wondering, uh, are, are, are the negotiations in, in English or in Japanese? The negotiations are conducted through an interpreter. Uh, well, you know, are, uh, do we have any people that speak Japanese? Yes, we have on excellent interpreters with the Secretary of State's Department. They do understand Japanese? Oh, they understand Japanese and English fluently. Well, you know, I think it goes it goes back a long ways. I think people have had difficulties in negotiating with the Japanese right from Pearl Harbor onward. Well, that was a particularly difficult negotiation, which ended in a world war exactly, in the Pacific. Exactly, exactly. And this is a form of war as well, and they've made it so difficult for our product to get into Japan, and they're just playing us off against the Poles and the Australians on coal and various other games. And... Uh, why we can't just sit back and try and mend our own, look after our business properly here, and not be so damn dependent on these people? Well, it's not a question of being dependent. There are our second largest market. We do sell them over All four right, billion dollars. There are other markets, so you don't have to dig every ton of coal out of the ground. And and I'm not saying it's true, but there are a lot of suspicions that we're darn near giving it away. 
That's true, Colin, and thanks for your call. Little suspicious that guy is of the Japanese. Go ahead from Pender Island. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Lumley. Good morning, sir. I was just wondering if you were aware of the uh, practice of shipping logs down to, uh, to states there and an export license from Vancouver to an American logging firm, and then they're loaded onto a ship under a, a new export license and gone to Japan, raw logs. That's not an export license by the federal government, to my knowledge. Well, uh... I thought we I thought we had a control on that. I thought we had an export committee here that uh, was very sticky about it. Caller. Yeah. Well, uh, you're saying they're going down there in a round log instead of a square timber, and they're you know they won't uh, export them out here because the tariffs on, so they ship them down there, sell them to the Americans, and the Americans sell them over to Japan. Yeah, one of the Americans' biggest trade at the moment is uh, unpeeled logs direct from privately owned timber to Japan which the IWA and the states are screaming about. And you're suggesting that they're using a loophole in the Canadian regulations to add to that supply of logs to Japan. If you're right, that's bad. Kofi didn't mention that, did he? I'm not aware of that. Uh, I might have a look yeah. at that. Go ahead, please. Hello. What are you? Oh, are you talking to me? Yes, do wake it up. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, what I was just wondering about was that uh, if the Japanese are so arrogant and discussing things with us, and uh, we buy our merchandise from them in excess of what they buy from us. Why can't we uh, Canadians just get together and uh, I put a quota on it, Japanese exports and, or imports, sorry, and just leave it at that? Well, there are many possibilities which uh, the government can undertake, but we like to do things in a positive, constructive way, and what we're really asking for is access to their markets, and we'll wait and see what the reaction is. I suppose so. I remember a great annoyance out here when you first brought in your protection for your Ontario and Quebec clothing factory in the rag trade, and the prices of everything we were getting from Korea and Southeast Asia doubled. Do you still have these uh, quotas on cheaper imports from... The Clothing from South We East have Asia. quotas on some products with some countries, but uh, not the same number we had, uh, say, 10 years ago. Well, I've got to ask you this question. Are we Westerners still subsidizing inefficient uh, clothing and shoe operations in Ontario and Quebec? Well, as a matter of fact, Jack, the uh, productivity in the textile industry increases in the last five years and one of the highest of all the manufacturing sectors in Canada. Times have changed. Times have changed. But they are protected by tariffs. There are certain uh, products are protected by tariffs. That's uh, why the price of shoes doubled. No, with respect to shoes, for example, we just uh, withdrew the quotas on, on leather shoes from all over the world on November 27th. Oh, private joke. Fathering them will now be able to buy a cheap pair of Gucci's. Is that right? <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, hello, Mr. Lumley. Yes, sir. My father has worked for Ford Motor Company for 29 years, and um, he's taken pay cuts, and right now he's at the bottom of the pole as far as seniority goes. And uh, I don't see any Japanese warehouses in B.C. taking any kind of pay cuts or any employees being laid off or anything like that. I don't know quite what you're getting at, but can I ask you, are you involved in leading on the Japanese to do much more of the construction of motor cars in this country? Yes, we made representation to the Automobile Manufacturers Association to start to think about putting a manufacturing assembly plant and parts plants in Canada, as well as purchasing more parts of Canadian auto parts manufacturers. Have they got any assembly plants in Canada? No, and that's one of our irritants, the fact that uh, the first two major announcements the Japanese made were for the United States, and now General Motors is discussing with Toyota for a third one. So we don't see why we can't have one of those plants in Canada, because we're just as productive as it is. We're a big market. Yes, we are. How many Japanese cars a year? 174,000 last year. 174,000? Do you happen to know how many Canadian cars were sold? Uh, 850-odd. Still a fair dif distance. Yes. But if you hammered them, we'd sell more like Canadian... 750, sorry, Jack. 750. 750. No, nobody there. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my concern is that um, uh, Johnson recently tabled his uh, budget estimate in for, for, for the year, and uh, my concern is the $130 billion national debt that we've, uh, uh, that the Liberal government have rung up over their years in office, and more particularly, uh, there was an article printed in the paper uh, dated February the 24th, which states clearly that it takes 540,000 working Canadians just to pay the interest on that debt. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the highest debt since the Second World War, and the government uh, keep uh, initiating restraint programs and telling everybody to restrain. 
uh, on spending, and they seem to be doing exactly the reverse. And I'd like, uh, I'd like the gentleman's comments there. Well, one of the major thrusts of Mr. McKechn's budget uh, was to bring expenditures down below the growth rate in the GNP. And, of course, uh, to do that, that obviously meant that there had to be some cuts in some other areas. And, of course, we all know the criticism which McKechn was under as a result of, of that particular Especially budget. from your cabinet colleagues, Mr. Kaplan, who called it seriously flawed, a political disaster. And your prime minister told Mr. Kaplan he was unforgivably naive. Do you think Kaplan's going to have to quit the cabinet for that boo-boo? I don't think so. I think that, uh, as Mr. Trudeau said, I wasn't here when it happened, but Mr. Trudeau said that uh, he didn't ask him to resign, and, and I think they've had their discussion. Uh, just, uh, you've been out of the country. i just got to fill you in. Well, the point hey, is, Just though, a moment, please. In my judgment, said Trudeau of Kaplan, he's been sufficiently chastised for the time being. God, he's got the sword of Damocles, Pierre Damocles, hanging over his head. Hello? <laughs> yeah, carry on. Yes, I, you know, they always uh, tell you these things, but, I mean, they've been in power some 13 years. And uh, they keep saying uh, the budget, the budget just came out. What's been happening for the last few years? And what are they doing to reduce that national debt? Yeah, what are you doing to reduce the national debt? Just exactly what uh, I said, what Mr. McKechn said during his budget, that he's going to control the growth of expenditures below the trend rate in the GNP. And uh, that creates a lot of pressure for us because everybody in the country wants assistance from the government. A call from Black Creek. Where is Black Creek? Black Creek is halfway between Courtney and Campbell River, Jack. You should know that. Yeah, I've forgotten. Go on, carry on. I can hardly hear you. Well, speak up. Yeah, uh, Jack, I wanted to talk to Mr. Lumley with regards to... Uh, uh, putting restrictions on merchandise and this type of thing. Uh, would that be in order to talk about ammunition for a short while? Ammunition? We're not going to start a war with the no. Japanese. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I was out bird hunting up in northern Alberta last year. And uh, um, I understood through the wholesalers that uh, there was an embargo placed on American ammunition to come into Canada, like Remington and Super X and all these various brands of ammunition, of shotgun shells. Now, uh, what happened last year was that I bought a couple of boxes of uh, Imperial long-range shells for a friend of mine when I was up in Peace River City. And when we come back, there were two of these shells uh, were blowbacks. They were, they were, they oh, were just, uh, they, come the on, quality come on. control was so poor that the powder didn't even push the wads out of the barrel. Now, luckily for this man, <laughs> He had a, a shotgun which was an automatic, consequently it didn't eject the empty. Just a minute, what's the point of your call? The you point want... is quality control when there's embargoes made on, on merchandise brought in from other the, countries. Oh, yeah. good point, from Black Creek. Well, I'm not aware of the specific uh, case in hand, uh, but there's no question about it. If you went to back to the bigger than neighbor policies, to a real protectionist uh, system that existed back in the 30s, uh, quality control does suffer, but as I said at the start of the game, it's not just free trade, it's fair trade. Okay. One, you were irritated, not irritated, you were upset by the Japanese lack of interest in Canada's problems. Lack of sensitivity to our two major issues. Force and you're going to hammer them again on the 10% tariff on some of our lumber, and you're trying to get them to do something about their automobile penetration of our market. Yes. And you want some car plants here. Yes. And you think the coal deal probably will be good. I think coal deal is good for Canada. Well, I hope your cabinet doesn't fly apart these days, but at least you've been a very positive minister who said something this morning, and that, on occasions, is a change. My thanks to Ed Lumley, the Federal Minister of Trade in the Trudeau government in uh, Ottawa. Next, our next cabinet minister in the Trudeau government, Warren Almond, after the break. Some people are determined to raise our political awareness and consciousness beyond British Columbia, for that matter, beyond Canada. And uh, I'm not surprised that Warren Almond is here this morning. He's a former Solicitor General in the Liberal government, very outspoken man. He was in the left wing of the Liberal Party. I don't think there was ever any doubt about that. Was the Warren? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't try to put myself in any kind of a category, but... Except that you're not a right winger. I hope not. No. Okay, now what? 
I don't think you are. No, I, don't I mean, think. I could go through your very generous record as Solicitor General, which you're a very humane man and totally against capital punishment, and all for softening the system on people. I wouldn't say softening, but making it more humane and uh, more rehabilitative. You say more humane and more rehabilitative, I'll say softening, right? All right. Well, let's talk about El Salvador. Uh, I picked up a very provocative article or item on the television last night which said, the Americans must interfere in, in El Salvador if only to save lives, because both the right-wing government of Duarte and the left-wing guerrillas are going to finish up slaughtering half the country. I think the exact figures now is that 20,000 Salvadorans have died in the past two years. Just an abominable state of affairs. 30,000. 30,000. Globe says 20, but I'll take your 30. What can be done to stop the slaughter now? Well, you know, the United States has been intervening for the last, for many years, but they've been intervening to prop up a very repressive military government. You have a situation in El Salvador where for the past 50 years they've had military governments. For generations that country's been run by, f by the 14 great families where 14% of the people in that country uh, control uh, or receive almost 50% of the income. In that situation, you know, if the United States I say the United States has been intervening, but intervening to maintain that situation. And, and if they're going to intervene, there's different ways of intervening. They certainly shouldn't be intervening militarily, but I think they should be going along uh, with France and Mexico and other countries, um, Holland, Italy, and so on, to try and negotiate uh, a lessening of the conflict, uh, to bring about peace and, and uh, security for those people. When you get uh, uh, people speaking out like Archbishop Romero, not a guerrilla, simply speaking out for justice for the people of his country, and he's shot down in his church. You, you get uh, uh, relief workers uh, doing humanitarian relief in, in those very poor villages, and they're, and they're raped and killed as these nuns were on the, on the side of the road to El Sal San Salvador. You know, the United States should be intervening to say to the government, of the, this government they're giving a lot of military aid to and, and economic aid, look it. You've got to stop that stuff and stop it soon. Uh, that's the kind of intervention I think they should be doing. They should be intervening on behalf of the broad elements that are really seeking democracy and fair play in that country. I'm sure many ordinary Canadians are quite validly confused. Duarte is not supposed to be a fascist as such. That's but he's right. backed by the military. He's probably owned by the military regime, right? Many now, people say that he, his background is a good one, that he, he's a... He, he has, he's a Democrat, but they feel he's, been, he's being dominated or controlled by the re reactionary military elements. But the American that. line just now, which many Canadians will accept, is that in the central South America, there is a plan, a pattern, a la the old domino theory, that the Marxist-Leninists, the Cubans, the communist guerrillas plan to take over and kind of breach the Monroe Doctrine. Ipso facto, the United States is worried. Now, is that believed or not? Is that the American attitude or not? That is the official American line, and it's complete nonsense. You don't have to be, if you've lived in a country where for 50 years you've had military government, repressive military government, where you've had a small percentage, an oligarchy in the country controlling the economy, the politics, the social life, you don't have to be told from Moscow or from Havana that things are wrong. In 1932, Jack, there was a strike which was very viciously put down by the military government and thousands of people were, were killed. This was long before You're Havana. saying this is a legitimate indigenous uprising against the local United Fruit Company people. It's, it's, I mean, it, that... Well, it's, 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 a, it's an thing. uprising by the majority of people who've been, been uh, I was going to say, screwed so many times sure. before. There were elections in 1972 where Duarte and Ungo were elected, but the military intervened and prevented them from taking office. Um, and, and, you know, the Americans continued to support those kind of governments. Um, it, you know, uh, the greatest hypocrisy, in my view, is when I was watching that, uh, that, that great television extravaganza where the Americans were condemning the military government in Poland and the martial law, and right. rightly so, because any reduction of, of, of justice and expression, freedom of expression, is wrong, and they should condemn it. But on the one hand, to condemn that, where maybe a few hundred people were killed, and that's bad too, nobody's... But then on the other hand, to prop up a military government in Central America where 30,000, approximately 30,000 people have been killed, and by the way, 10 to 1 of those people that have been killed are civilians, not guerrillas or soldiers. That's right.
both sides seem to be so you know, there's a great hypocrisy there how the one hand you can condemn military government over here and 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 prop it up and, and feed it with arms on the other side Well, your geography is better than my geography okay salvador you've got a right-wing dictatorship of some kind in effect well it's supposed to, it was supposed to be reform hunter but in in fact it is a right-wing dictator nicaragua what do you got nicaragua you've got a, a new revolutionary government in power uh, one might say, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's got broad, broad based support, but, uh, and they've promised to have elections in a few years, but they were there, the uh, Sandinistas who overthrew the Somosan dictatorship. Guatemala, what do you got? You've got a military dictatorship, much worse than the one that was in El Salvador, and there the Americans under Carter cut off their military aid. What about Honduras? You've been down there recently. Honduras just had an election. Uh, the the people I was there right uh, just before the new president took office and uh, a liberal was elected a liberal in their sense uh, there was great hope but unfortunately as soon as he took office he appointed as number two man the head of the military and the military seems to be taking over there as well now is that where the refugees go from Salvador to Honduras yeah there are approximately 400,000 refugees and displaced persons as a result of this war in a country of 4.5 million people. 10% of the population yes. is refugees. 200,000 within their own country, driven from their own towns and cities, and 200,000 outside the country. The greatest number, Jack, in Honduras. Then we haven't even talked about Argentina or Chile or Brazil, have we? Well, I, I'm, I was concentrating on Central America, where there are six countries. No, but I'm painting the picture well, that right. the whole of Central and South America is backed by the United States, only where there are repressive regimes. Well, they may. They, I think they're friendly with those countries that are also uh, making strong attempts at democracy. Costa Rica. There are other. Is this going to lead to a war, a real, full-scale war on this continent? I don't mean nuclear war. I mean, right. We, we, is we, it going to lead to an open, you know, intervention by, say, the Americans? I would hope not, Jack, and, and the hope ro lies in the fact that there's growing public opinion in the United States and in the United States Congress opposing the simplistic view of Central America that we hear from Haig and we hear from Reagan. Is there a menace of communist over, overtaking Central America? I think th there's, a, there's a strong possibility that there are reform governments that will come to power and they may have to come to power through revolution and they, there should be reform in those countries. But you see, you hear, you hear Mr. Haig speaking, or General Haig, he says, uh, there's, there, these are leftist guerrillas, and he get, by the implication, leftist equals communist equals mm. controlled by Russia. Sure, they're left. If left means they're sick of military government and sick of, of repression and sick of, uh, of, uh, of the terror, then they're, then they're left. But that doesn't mean they're tied to Marxism but it's or not, tied to... It, you're saying it's not a communist plot. It's not at all. Not at all. Probably the communists, communists are quite happy with what, by what's taking place because they know it, it upsets the Americans. But the Americans, I think, would be wiser to, to try and work with those governments as they are now working with Red China. The Americans are working with Red China. There's a communist government in China. They're working with Yugoslavia. They're working with the Soviet Union. Right. Well, they should be working. They sh instead of driving countries like Nicaragua and the reform elements in El Salvador into the Soviet bloc, they should be working with them to encourage reform elements rather than repressing it. Warren Allman, um, last job was Solicitor General. No, Consumer Affairs and Indian Affairs. Oh, that's when you got in trouble. Oh, I got in trouble <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's body packing you today, has it? Uh, who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know who are Nobody these people. Nobody had an idea. All microphones are visible. So After the break. <laughs> Well, now you say there's a rising tide of American opinion against intervention in Salvador. I've got no feeling for Canadian opinion, do you? Uh, well, Canadian opinion is beginning to come around too, although Canadians generally, Jack, are, are quite uh, unfamiliar with Central America. They know the Caribbean, they've been to Jamaica, they've been to Barbados and so on. But with, when you mention Costa Rica, Honduras, they don't even know hardly where they are. They don't even know how to put them together. In I couldn't tell you if Costa Rica is Puerto Rico or not. It isn't, is it? Well, I think that is general with Canadians. No, it isn't. Um, and uh, is Puerto Rico a state? Uh, Puerto Rico is a, is a uh, is a part of the United States yeah. in a sense. It's a, not a full state, but it's a territory. Question. We generally look at it and say, one, the Americans are baddies. They support the, the right wingers. The left-wingers are commies. You know, that's what we say broadly. Well, that's a speaking. simplistic view. The simplistic view. 
I thought Canada was having some part in supervision of elections. Was it in El Salvador? Canada was asked, along with several other countries, to come and observe these elections. Um, we feel the elections, uh, many of us feel that they're a fraud. They're a fraud because the major opposition parties won't run because uh, to, to put yourself forward as a candidate is putting yourself on a death list. That's it's, right. it's almost like suicide. And there's no free discussion of the real issues in the media or on the platform, and therefore it's not a real election as we know it. And uh, to put a stamp of approval on it in any way, we think, is to uh, participate in a, in a fraud. All right, well, is this not Canada a turned it down because they felt, they, unlike Uganda and other places where they went as an observer for elections, they had no real power to investigate and report. Right. Is this not a classic case where the United Nations might put in keep peacekeeping forces? We recommended... Uh, we, that, we. Well, the group of us that went down there, uh, the, we went, I went down with two other MPs, and there was another subcommittee of parliament with Morris Duprat and Flora MacDonald and so on who went down, and they came to the same opinions as we did. Most of us think that there must be an international... Uh, the international community must assist the, the, the El Salvador government and other elements... But why on. not United Nations? Why does United Nations it's, apparently ignore this? Well, uh, they're trying... El Salvador is trying to, and it, it's trying to uh, get some of these... Not El Salvador, uh, other countries like... Uh, by the way, there was a, a resolution before the UN Commission on Human Rights last week condemning uh, these atrocities in Canada abstained. I was quite critical of that. I don't know why we abstained. I tried to get the reasons from Mr. McGuigan. He gave me some reasons, but I, I checked them out. They don't seem to be strong to me. I, I think we copped out on that one. Uh, we wouldn't even vote against atrocities. We didn't. Uh, 25 countries voted against. The Americans vote, uh, voted for the resolution. The Americans voted against with Argentina and Uruguay with these right-wing uh, dictators. Oh, that's why we abstained. We didn't want to annoy the Americans too much. Well, we, we've taken a very independent position with Cuba over the years, and the Americans didn't like it. We, we should be doing the same thing with, uh, with El Salvador, in my opinion. Is Cuba, is Cuba the mainspring of the problem down there? Are they the supply center? No. Most journalists that have gone into El Salvador and visited those refugee camps say the arms that they see are American arms. And, and the, the guerrillas are getting those arms from their raids on military establishments in El Salvador. And the, the Salvadorian troops, some of them are selling corrupt, you know, are, are corrupt troops are selling their own arms to the guerrillas. So most of those arms are American arms, as far right. as people can see. What should Canadians do? Well, I think Canadians got to inform themselves better about this situation. They should be, uh, and, uh, and speaking out, trying to, inf trying to bring about greater public opinion so that Canada contributes to world public opinion to, to do something to bring cessation of hostilities. It would be easier to do that if we were prosperous, and we ain't very prosperous at the moment by our previous standards. What, what we also have to do, that may be so, but we also have to do is contribute, as we have been doing, continue to contribute to our, our aid groups, to Oxfam, to, uh, to the churches, to uh, peace and development. Uh, you know, a lot of the Canadian churches have very good uh, relief programs, and they're Canadian, helping down there. Are you telling me that Canadians are really lacking in social conscience and the problems in the world elsewhere? No, J Jack. I think it's they're concerned about other places in the world, and they haven't been too much tied in to Central America, which is in our own hemisphere, at the bottom of our own continent, and it's very close to us. And we, we, we should try and be, be better informed about these people that are, are our neighbors. Do we, make it easy, do we make it easy for political refugees to come from Central America? E yes, and we've increased our, our quota has been 1,000 last year and 1,000 this year, and it wasn't taken up fully. But it isn't taken up because if you see, visit these people, they're mostly uh, campesinos from villages. They're Spanish-speaking, and they're li they've lived in warm climates. Uh, they'd have a hard time, most of them up here, but we have about three to 500 that are up here now. Okay, Juan, we'll try some phone calls to you this morning. It probably won't stick just to Salvador, but you never can tell. Okay. Because you know how parochial we tend to be in British Columbia. I'm sure you do. After the break. Well, a call from Seattle, which is in the United States, to Warren Allman. Go ahead from Seattle. Well, your geography is a little better in that case. Uh, some information, Jack. Puerto Rico enjoys uh, Commonwealth status in, uh, in our government. And two points your guest seems to be avoiding in this, that a military takeover has always preceded a Marxist takeover. And all these bleeding hearts 
I've wound uh, the sergeant in with them who wound up friendly to a Marxist. Another thing is geography. If you look at your polar projection of a map that you see, on the other side of Canada is Russia. To the west is also Russia and China. If we go to the south, and you got you to get a draw line from, from Cuba across to Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, you will see uh, like a circle, and always inside that circle is Mexico, United States, and Canada. What's the point? Yeah, that's the point is that, that no matter which guy you support, you're going to wind up the national characteristics, which is eliminate the opposition. I don't care what they call their government. It's going to be eliminate the opposition. Now, we try to tell them that you form a government and you divide the land up. The other side is saying you keep all the land and you call it reform. Okay, now, uh, I haven't heard that, uh, that particular version. The... Uh, you know, the president of Mexico has made proposals uh, for reform there that the, uh, for, for bringing about peace in that country, which had been agreed to uh, by the, uh, the, uh, the FDR, which is the main umbrella group in opposition in, in exile, and by the FMLN, and they say that they don't want a military victory. They'd rather have a negotiated uh, peace. They feel there's been too much killing, and they're looking for some way to move to, uh, to a democratic system. You know, uh, your, your, I must say, your, your general view of, uh, of uh, right-wing dictatorships m are preceded by ones of the, of the left is a cynical view. If we look at British history and French history and the history of other countries, they were cutting the heads off of British kings for uh, generations, and democracy took a long time to take hold. You know, we, 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 we should be a, as patient with other countries as we were with ourselves. Um, uh, you know, the United States uh, was formed by means of a revolution against the British, and uh, they had uh, troubles in the beginning. They had a civil war. Um, you know, I think there's no alternative if we really believe in justice and, and, uh, and the principles that founded your own country in the United States that, that we, support, we, we, we cease supporting these right-wing military governments and try to give more aid and assistance to the reform elements in these countries. Call reform. Their idea of reform is not cynical. You need to take a look at their history. Is eliminate the opposition. Well, I don't agree with you there. Uh, Fair I, enough. I, anyway, you think that this Canadian politician is another bleeding heart? Is that right? Yes. Uh, they've got to settle it themselves, and I don't care what the whole world says. It well, never gets settled, and they have to do it themselves. Well, I agree with that. Then why then is the United States giving arms to one side and not to the other if they're going to settle because it themselves? I don't particularly care to have a Marxist government. Well, it's not... Be uh, surrounded. Well, I can... On that point, Jack... Listen now. Just a minute. Go on, carry on, Walter. You know, when I, when I was down there the entire week, which wasn't long, but I spoke to people who had been there for five years, seven years, not once did I hear anybody quoting Marx, Ingalls, Lenin, or Stalin, or anybody else. They were quoting the, found, the spirit behind that revolution is a Christian one. Continual references to the Bible, to the Scripture. There may be some hardcore Marxists there, but the majority of those people are not Marxists, their, their, their revolution is inspired by the conditions in those countries and a Christian philosophy. And in the new Nicaraguan government, there are three Catholic priests in the cabinet. Thanks for your call from Seattle, oh boy. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, Mr. Ullman, uh, I certainly uh, ag agree with you uh, with your points uh, regarding the, the uh, influence of the Christian faith in El Salvador. And, and that was apparent by everybody in the panel at the Latin America Committee for the Center for Investigative Journalism. Uh, which I attended about a month ago, and um, I, I hope that um, the liberals will, uh, as well as, well as uh, the other parties, will be looking into the problems of investigating um, what's going on in, in some of the other countries down there, uh, uh, such as Bolivia. But uh, my question for you and a uh, point I'd like to make regarding the vote in the UN, uh, you say you really haven't uh, received any kind of answer from McGuigan to your well, satisfaction on that. Well, I received an answer, but I, I don't agree with their reasons for abstaining. O okay, well, I, I think that part of the reason is, is the fact that we are uh, uh, still part of NATO, and I heard you last night uh, saying that you don't think that that is significant, but I, I believe that it, it is a significant reason why we're going ahead with the testing for the cruise missile in Canada, and and uh, there's been some talk that if uh, nuclear weapons are used, the first place may be in Latin America. And I think that you're on the right track, but I think you're pulling your punches a little bit. Well, I don't agree with you that I don't think NATO has anything to do with this. We were members of NATO when we took an independent position in Cuba. 
We were members of NATO when we took an independent position from the United States on Red China and recognized them long before but they did. You're doing it in, in the United Nations right now. You're not doing it. No, but, well, wait a minute. In you some know, things we are. Elections. Well, well, look, at France is in NATO, and France is, take, is supporting the Mexican position. In NATO is one thing. Policy vis-a-vis -vis Latin America is another. We've been free to disagree, and we've disagreed with the United States now on energy policy, on fisheries policy, on on acid rain, on many things. The fact that we're in NATO doesn't mean we agree with the U.S. on everything, nor with other NATO countries. Look at West Germany. Look at France. Look at Italy. Italy, in that resolution that you talked about at the U.N. Um, um, uh, Commission on Human Rights, the vote there where we abstain, France, Italy, Holland, which are NATO countries, voted for the resolution the United States voted against. I can give you many examples. So being members of NATO merely relates to the defense treaty vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, these countries in the Soviet bloc. It has nothing to do with our policy in Latin America, and it shouldn't right, impede us at all. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Allman. Um, I think what the other caller is trying to say is let's not just disagree. Let's really disagree. Let's do something. Um, well, what's the reason? Why disagree just for disagreement's sake? No, I mean, no, 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 no. Hang on. We've, I agree <laughs> with everything you've said to this point regarding uh, Central America. I believe that the paranoia reaction, paranoid reaction of the United States administration towards this expansionism of what they quote as, what they call as communism, uh, they have really no proof that there's any communist activity happening there in the first place. If it is happening there, it's a natural progression of thought. The young people that are picking up rifles and arms down in El Salvador today are obviously thinking human beings. Now, I know as a fact that at 19 or 20 years of age, it would have taken a hell of a lot to get me up killing people if it wasn't for some major reason. Now, if there's a repressionist government doing horrible things down there, which is very obvious, then these people, these young people, who the Americans cast off in this negative term, gorilla, uh, without giving any kind of uh, individual treatment to the subject at all. They're cast off as being absolute <coughs> useless individuals that carry gun guns and slaughter people. I don't believe that's true. I believe that a lot of this uh, is brainwashing on the part of the American government on the American, for the American people's sake. I believe that they're trying to fuel a major conflict so that they can improve their economy by selling weapons. And I believe that it's Canada's turn to stand up and uh, all Canadians who are listening right now send a little note. All you have to do is send one note to your MP. Say, either uh, be strong about El Salvador or lose your position, period. And get very, very strong statement about it. Get, an, get yourself. You can introduce it. You're an MP. Introduce a bill into the House of Parliament saying that we are going to uh, hit them with a heavy duty trade sanction if they don't get the hell out of El Salvador and let those people clean up the mess themselves. Mr. Allman? Well, I, I agree that, uh, that Canadian citizens should protest to their MPs of all political parties, and I, in turn, of course, will, I will continue to make representations to my government, perhaps by means of motion. But, uh, you know, contrary to the implication of the last caller's uh, remarks, you know, I, I'm a liberal, and when I Despite that fact, if I think their, their policy isn't correct, I'm saying so. But I'm not going to... Uh, there, I, I don't think you can generalize it completely. There are some things I think that they've done that are correct. And I think they were correct in, in Cuba. I think they were correct in China. It had a lot to do with pushing our policy with respect to China. So I... I and Trudeau was the prime minister then. And, uh, you know, I think he made some good moves. When he makes a bad move, I call it that way. I'm not just going to criticize just to criticize. No, and I'm not up saying and, do that, but I'm saying can't you possibly introduce a bill well, not a bill, but I can introduce a motion. Bill is a motion. I, yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not familiar with what your procedure is, but I yeah. do know one thing. You're our only voice. Yeah. I yeah. can only get onto Mr. Webster. Thank God for Mr. Webster. I can only get onto Mr. Webster's show once in a while and express my point of view. By the way, I'm. I'm not the only one that takes this position. The the subcommittee, the House of Commons subcommittee on the Caribbean and Latin America, uh, which put out an interim report just before Christmas took the same position on the elections, took a very good position on Central America, and the majority of people on that subcommittee are liberals, and the chairman is Maurice Duprat. Uh, so we have other allies in Parliament. That's Thank wonderful. You. Now, what we want to do is try and get some kind of national attention in the United States on their press, because their press motivates well, the American emotions. We have to get some kind enough. of major yeah. action by Canada so that the Americans are reporting that to their people. <laughs> if the Americans turn around and see their friends in the North, expressing a very major concern in the form of something very, very definite. Okay. And they're taking an action. Maybe they'll stop and look. I agree with that. Good. <laughs> Much obliged. Okay. Are you in the media? 
He's gone. I <laughs> ask him a question, he hangs up. Yeah, but, <laughs> After the break. Well, I've been doing talk shows for a thousand and one years, and I must say I'm pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest and in the caliber of questioning I've been this morning. I mean, left to myself, I'd have gone after you as a real bleeding heart, you know, on Canadian issues. Sorry, I can't get at you this morning. I'll come back. But I've got to ask you the one question. <laughs> How long do you think Kaplan can sit under there, under the <laughs> lash from Pierre? Unforgivably naive. Okay for the time being. Gee, wouldn't you have quit? Uh, well, I don't think I would have uh, sent a letter like that. I, uh, <laughs> I th it must be very tough on him. I, I, I really can't understand how that happened. I'm, I, I'll have to ask Bob Kaplan sometime how, he came ab how it came about. I just had to get in one local question. It's nice to be able to embarrass people about their colleagues, but you're not in the cabinet, so you're... You know, I'm freer now. I've got more freedom. That's right, much freer. And you use your freedom, too. I mean, you don't think, for instance, that the women's rights and Indian rights are properly stated in the Constitution yet, do you? Well, certainly not the Indian rights. Uh, I think the word existing has weakened that clause considerably. Of course it has. But you know, a lot, an awful lot of people don't want to give the country back to the Indians. Well, they don't want it all back, but they want their fair share. It's most of it. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I'm only joking. Uh, calls. Subject? El Salvador. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Owen. Yes. I was just wondering if you could clarify what you were saying about the Christian involvement in El Salvador. What exactly did you mean by that now? Well, when, you, when we were down in these refugee camps with thousands of refugees, when we spoke to them about, you know, why, why were they doing what they were doing in El Salvador, why the Civil War, of course, they referred to the conditions. And anybody that reads the history will know the conditions. As uh, the last caller pointed out, you, you know, uh, if, if any of us lived in these conditions, we would be driven to uh, revolution, not because we would be communists, but because we just want fair play and justice. Right. Uh -huh. but if you refer to a philosophy, like when we were there, people were saying, you know, Christ was born in a stable like we were. He drew, drew, drove the exploiters out of the temple, and we're going to drive the exploiters out of our country. The references that they gave uh, were to the Christian Bible. They, when they spoke about heroes, their heroes were Bishop Romero and other people that I didn't know, but were, who were El Salvadorians, who uh, were uh, very forthright and frank uh, Christians uh, of the, uh, you know, working in the in the in the villages. Uh, you felt a real uh, a sense of morality, of, uh, well, almost a higher type of morality. Well, what I saw were a group of people who just didn't uh, live their Christianity in a church. They were translating it into social and political action to bring about fairness and, and justice and honesty. And they, they uh, you know, they would, when they were referring to the Beatitudes, we'd see these signs uh, posted up in the tents and in certain little buildings which were quotes from the Beatitudes, the, uh, you know, blessed are the poor and so on. Uh, they, and they were trying to, they just weren't going to church and saying this. As a matter of fact, their they had their church services outdoors. They were, they were trying to put that into action. But so is it, is, is, that's is, what is I that, meant. Do you think, you know, what they trotted out to show you, or do you think it was, uh, I mean... Yeah, but look at, look at the people who, look at the new Nicaraguan government, as I, I think I might have mentioned earlier. There are uh, three or four priests in there. One of them trained in the United States for 22 years, um, a Mary Noel missionary who's the foreign minister. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think so. I, I think... See, you know, talk about the Mary Noles. They're, 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 they're uh, you know, uh, Mark, so-called Marxist connections have been well advertised in publications like Time magazine. Yeah, but who's... Wait a minute. Now, that's, that's, now you're repeating what is the line of the extreme right. Anybody that wants, that speaks out, out against injustice well, and wants Time reform. Is the extreme right? I don't know. Well, I mean, I see, I'm not... Uh, well, I'm not blaming you, but no. I hear that line. What, what I see is if you stand for reform, if you don't agree with these right-wing governments in Latin America, then you're a Marxist. You know, you may have no... Uh, let's just get to the point. Time magazine does represent a right very effectively. Well, I don't know. Doesn't it? Well, I, I, can't, I don't read Time magazine that often. I don't know how to brand it. Oh, you, would your government... Uh, 
Well, I don't read it. I, I, I don't read it. I read it now and then. But okay, but let anyway, me, you, let me you say would this. honestly believe that the, 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 the Christian church is, uh, is, is really, uh, it, they consider it now all it a moral is. type of holy war. Good, comment. jolly yes, good show. And this is the people, too, sir. It's not just uh, clergymen. These are people that are, lay people that all are All right, let's see way. what Sam and Arm has to say about El Salvador. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Allman. Yes, madam. Sorry, I'm going to switch subjects on you. You are going to be presenting a private member's bill, an amendment to the gun control legislation. Well, I, I've presented that bill. Yes. I, I've tabled uh, it. You presented the original bill, C-51. Well, that, uh, well, that's a long time ago. That, yes, uh, I know. Uh, what I want to know is how does an ordinary individual go about getting a copy of that bill, C-51? Well, I have been trying for two months. Well, it became, it's C-451, 451. No, no, that's your amendments. I want a copy of the bill that is already Hold passed. on, ma'am. I'll talk to you off the air. A, a number of people asked me to talk to you about gun control. I didn't get a chance this morning. When you're back, we'll do gun control. A number of people out here hate you and fear you because of your control over guns and your attitude towards them. Every Canadian should have the right to carry a rifle. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I know you don't. Am I going to do the I Stanley Pop thing? I think responsible Canadians should have the right to Have I time to do the Stanley Pop thing? Have I? Yes or no? Yes, yes I have. My thanks to Warren Allman. Quite a surprising program of El Salvador. You might even raise our political, political consciousness a little. Give my regards to poor old Bob Kaplan. I'll be back with Steve and Stanley Park after the break. Jack, another Vancouver landmark is about to disappear, which brings us here to the Georgia Street Gateway to Stanley Park. Nestled in one corner in this bit of world-renowned real estate is the old Stewart Building. It'll be 75 years old this year, and for the last 20 years, it's been home to the Gallery of BC Arts. Now Edith and Herbert Clark have been given to until the end of the month to get out, because the Stewart Building is about to be knocked down. It has been called an early example of tenement architecture, if such a thing dared to exist here. In the last decade, it has been allowed to deteriorate to the point where the fire marshal has ordered it demolished or repaired. It is owned by a Hong Kong businessman, Stanley Ho, and managed by Macaulay, Nichols, and Maitland. Okay, so and you want to reach out by product? Yeah, okay. and see if you can either that or phone me. The major tenants, Herbert and Edith Clark, have been selling BC art to tourists from all over the world here since 1962. They have been told by their landlord that the building will be demolished on April the 1st. They know the building needs work, but point out that it was rewired just eight years ago. Now they are taking their Save the Steward appeal to City Hall in the form of a petition. And we've got over a thousand names in the petition. And Can I call your phone? Sure. Oh, we moved our phone. Harry, can you bring the phone up this way? The notice from the fire marshal uh, called for a certain uh, work to be done on the building to bring it up to the code standard. If that was not done, the alternative was to demolish it. Oh, so the property managers were offered a, a choice, either rip it down or fix it up? Yes, right, they were. Now, what did the uh, property managers tell you? They had decided, obviously, to rip the place down, right? Uh, right. It seems as though no one is willing to spend the necessary money on it to bring it up to the code. Um, I was told by the president of Macaulay Nichols that we could stay here until they were ready to demolish it, and I said we could get out in three days, if necessary, uh, when that arrangement was all set and in order. Uh, however, he said we could stay until that was definite. However, I was called the next day by his building manager and said they still wanted to stick to the 31st of uh, March. Well, so as far as you know, they're going to rip it down on April the 1st. Well, it's a possibility, but how do they do that with tenants in upstairs? And um, we're still here in the bicycle shop. Honestly, now, do you really think this building is worth saving? Well, I certainly do. I feel that it should be a heritage building. Uh, meetings have been taken up in this regard, uh, particularly uh, two years ago a special meeting was called at the time we'd had a serious accident uh, with the building. A car had gone through and a special meeting was called to dis discuss it. And uh, it was uh, designated heritage at that time by the Heritage Committee. And at the, at the time that it, uh, this was brought up, um, but it was recently voted down again uh, by council. Uh, uh, well, uh, recently on, um, on um, 
Well, they were asked to spend some more money to take a second look at it, and they decided to turn it well, yeah, down. Yes, that's right. But at the uh, former meeting, uh, the city had been willing to meet uh, Mr. Ho 50-50 in repairing the place. That was two it years up. ago. That was two years ago now, yes. But Mr. Ho didn't take it up. This is the landlord who lives in Hong yeah. Kong, yeah. Yes. a very wealthy businessman in Hong yes, Kong. Yes, this was a representative of uh, Macaulay Maitland Nichols who brought mm -hmm. this up. Yeah. And it was the, that option was declined. Yes. Well, at least nothing was done, let's put it that way. It never seemed to go before City Council. This is the one thing I couldn't understand, that it hadn't gone before City Council, what it was supposed to do, so... You know, I, I'm told by Macaulay's Nichol, Nichols Maitland that it would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars to bring this building up oh. to snuff. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? It seems to have become inflated rapidly. We heard 200,000, and when I was over there, they said perhaps 500,000. Now you've doubled it, so <laughs> what is it? What do you think's happening around here then? What do you think's going on? Well, it's hard to say. Perhaps the owner would like to get rid of the building so that he can get a good price for the property um, from the people next door. What, uh, what kind of response have you been getting, Mrs. Clark, to your petition? A very good response. I think we have well over a thousand names now, and they're still coming in. So I feel that uh, this will give a little strength behind our, uh, you know, position in pushing the uh, idea. What, what's, yeah. what's, uh, what's been happening in the last few years? The building looks very run down. Yes, well, nothing has been done to it, uh, uh, externally at least. Uh, there has been uh, rewiring done by, um, you know, that the city insisted upon. It was fully uh, wired. We have conduit throughout, and uh, smoke detectors have been put in. Fire new, alarms new fire are in. Alarm. So uh, from a protection standpoint, we're better off than we've ever been. Do you here. think uh, there's been uh, a deliberate effort to let the building get run down? Well, that's my feeling, that uh, this is the whole idea is to m make it to an eyesore so that it will be torn down. Demolition yes. by neglect. Yeah, well, that's right, yes. What will you do? Will you leave by the end of the month? <laughs> well, we're pretty close to the end of the month. Uh, we would Naturally, we would have to uh, uh, move out shortly after, but not, not to remain in business, you know, if this it, thing went through. You've been here for 20 yeah. years selling yes. the goods of BC yeah. artists. That's have right. you got another place to go? Not at this moment. No, no place. Upstairs from the gallery, there are seven residential tenants who live very cheaply in a prime district. And that is where the rentalsman has created a snag in the owner's plans. He has ruled that the tenancy agreement was violated when the eviction notices were issued. Well, his ruling, which came down uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was the, uh, the termination notice, as it stood from the uh, property manager, was null and void because of uh, two or three... Uh, contraventions to the Residential Tenancy Act. One being he didn't give you 119 days notice. That's correct. And another one was a certain payment of money. Uh, well, not quite, not even that one, uh, even though they didn't offer any uh, moving expenses either. No, they, they didn't have a demolition permit, which in fact they must have uh, under the terms they stated. What happened when the, did uh, Macaulay Nichols Maitland ever come back to you after this rentalsman's decision? Uh, a representative of the landlord was here on Friday and Saturday offering us $450 if we would uh, vacate in 12 days, sign oh. a letter to the effect. That wasn't good enough? No, we were under the uh, legislation, we were offered $500 maximum. vacation costs also, maximum, and 119 days. So why should we take $450 and 12 days? So what do you intend to do? Well, we intend to uh, follow the due processes laid out under the uh, legislation, which in fact, I, I've heard from the rentalsman uh, negating and quashing the, uh, the eviction notice. So until I hear otherwise from the rentals, when I consider myself living here in quiet enjoyment of the premises. So the Stewart Building's last stand will be on a foundation of a legislative tangle. At least one Vancouver alderman plans to raise that issue in council. As for the future construction on a new residential project has begun next door. That may best indicate what's in store for the Stewart. <laughs> I got seven seconds to say goodbye. Goodbye. See you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. precisely.
Canada is annoyed at Japan on trade. Check TV at midnight.